really pro providing the foundation for a lot of what I'm going to talk about. So with, with regards to the CSF physiology, um, pathophysiology, circulation, and then in terms of hydrocephalus, the incidence, the classification schemes, uh, the clinical findings, imaging, and, and just a brief introduction into some of the surgical procedures. So I'm not going to touch on much of that except perhaps the uh, etiologies that we'll see. But, you know, when you talk to parents about hydrocephalus or even other surgeons, um, they oftentimes are criticized by, because, you know, shunts frequently malfunction and it can be a very difficult problem to, to treat. You know, it, 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 it seems to be a very simple problem when you think about it. Fluid builds up and we have to just treat it, drain it, um, and, and take care of the problem. But it's really not that simple. Um, hydrocephalus essentially is a, a disorder of CSF physiology, and it results um, in, a, in the increase in the intraventricular pressure, which leads to accumulation of CSF within the ventricles, and it's frequently associated with elevated intracranial pressure. It's most often because of an inability of the brain um, or our bodies to reabsorb the CSF that's being, being, being produced. In rare circumstances where there may be hypersecretion related to a choriplexus papilloma or choroid plexus hyperplasia, then you may have an overproduction of CSF, but generally it's because of a failure of absorption of the CSF that's being created. We know that without treatment, a lot of secondary phenomenon can occur. Um, it can lead to neurovascular damage and inflammation of the brain, as well as additional tissue injury. The, the cortical mantle becomes thinned and stretched out. This damages the ependym of the, of the ventricle and leads to accumulation of metabolites in the subependymal zone. And it can also damage the neurons. And if you look at autopsies of hydrocephalic brains, there's fewer synaptic connections and there's just a general less richness of the dendrites in the, in the neurons themselves. And all of this contributes to just further compromise in their neurological development. So this is really something that's critical to treat. I just wanted to touch on the etiology because it's really important in terms of deciding what type of surgery might be appropriate for an individual patient. And this, the, the table on the right is from a publication a few years ago from from the Lancet talking about the different types of hydrocephalus. And generally it's the, the way that people often describe this or break it down is into congenital and acquired varieties. And, and some of the more common congenital varieties are those like primary aqueductal stenosis, uh, 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 a tumor that's present in a, in a newborn or a young infant, um, intrauterine infections like cytomegalovirus, some genetic uh, disorders like the L1 CAM, the L1 cell adhesion molecule disorder, or X-linked hydrocephalus, and then Chiari malformations, whether those associated with the Chiari 2 malformation or even Chiari 1 malformations can sometimes lead to development of hydrocephalus. Most of those, though, are Chiari 2 malformations. And then there's other acquired forms related to infections, hemorrhage, intraventricular or subarachnoid hemorrhages, and also tumors, so just some of the more common ones. But I think from a practical point of view, it's really important to understand the difference between a communicating and non-communicating hydrocephalus. As Mark mentioned, all hydrocephalus is obstructive. At some level, there's an obstruction to the, to the um, either flow or absorption of CSF. But the distinction between communicating and non-communicating is important because it helps us decide which may be the best type of treatment. So in a non-communicating hydrocephalus, as in these two upper pictures here, you can see a young boy with, 15-year-old boy with a, a tectal tumor and acute hydrocephalus, there's clearly obstruction to the passage of CSF through the cerebral aqueduct and leading into the classic triventricular pattern of hydrocephalus and elevated intracranial pressure. So up until that moment in time where this boy um, finally closed off his aqueduct, his CSF circulation was fairly normal. Um, other types of malformations like uh, essentially congenital stenosis or other other, other things where the foraminal uh, outlets of the fourth ventricle may not be formed um, can also be, uh, you know, fall into this category. The communicating types are, 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 are known for their extraventricular obstructions. So somewhere either at the, um, at the subarachnoid space, venous sinus interface, um, there's an inability for the CSF to be absorbed. So that's seen in infections or, or hemorrhages and then in, in, in Children with skull base abnormalities, where they can have venous hypertension and occlusion of the uh, of the like or, or narrowing or stenosis of leading to venous hypertension, which makes it very difficult for um, the CSF to be reabsorbed. But the classic is a child like this here, who actually was operated on last Friday, who newborn with a very large head and evidence on the on the susceptibility imaging of prior hemorrhage in utero, 
an, an, an acute non-communicating, or excuse me, communicating hydrocephalus or everything is open here. Um, and the CSF is just not, not absorbed. So in terms of deciding who to treat, you know, it's in some cases, it's very simple. If, if the child has large ventricles and clear signs of elevated pressure, then the decision is usually obvious. They need some type of CSF diversion. But a lot of kids have large ventricles and they may be relatively asymptomatic. Um, so um, you'll see a child that may be macrocephalic and their ventricles may be moderately enlarged. And then those without symptoms and those ones are the difficult uh, ones to think about. And there's very little direction in the literature. Um, so most neurosurgeons, if uh, in this day and age, if they have an asymptomatic child who's developmentally normal with, with mild to moderate degrees of ventricular megaly, we'll watch that um, very closely at times. We'll watch that to for any symptoms to develop before plunging in and trying to treat. But there may be a bias towards treatment in younger kids, kids less than six months of age in the same scenario um, who can be very difficult to properly evaluate in terms of their developmental function or neurological um, uh, progress. So it's important to recognize though that really there's no long-term non-surgical treatment for hydrocephalus. Um, diuretics have been tried, but they're really marginally, if at all, effective and they're really not recommended for children with hydrocephalus. Um, so once the decision has been made to intervene, then the treatment options really are based upon the etiology. So what's the cause of the hydrocephalus? What's the patient age that has important implications? And what, if any, are the uh, associated comorbidities? Um, and it really comes down to, do we shunt this child or is there some endo endoscopic solution to their hydrocephalus? Everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.